in the studio today with Mick Heimberger. Uh, we're in Culver City, California, not too far from the Antelope Demo Studio. How are you doing today, Mick? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, for taking some time out with us uh, from some of your projects. What kind of uh, work do you do here again? Well, I work for a company called uh, Sub Pop Music. We do music for trailers, movies, film, TV, and commercials. And what kind of projects have you worked on recently? Uh, for movies, um, we just placed a uh, rock song in the latest Al Pacino movie, Stand Up Guys. I don't think it's out yet. And we just pitched a, uh, a rock, another rock song for the latest or the sequel to the 300 movie. you were going to show us a little bit later some work that you did uh, on the Muppet last Muppet movie, right? Yeah, for sure. Looking around your room, you've got a lot of hardware um, outboard gear. So you kind of work with a, a combination kind of setup with in-the-box sense and some processing and, and sense outboards and Moog. And I see the Axis virus back there. What Can you tell us a little bit about some of the gear you like to work with? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we do mostly analog going in. Uh, we we do we have uh, some Moog stuff, Little Fatty, and uh, some Dave Smith synths that we combine with software like the Virus, which is half software, half hardware. And um, so we do it that way with instruments. We go through real amps all the way, preamps, compressors. Uh, normally we do some API stuff on guitar into a distressor into the Orion. I've A-B'd a lot lately after getting the Orion, and uh, in my opinion, the Orion wins hands down in, in every way, feature-wise, channel-wise, uh, price-wise. Uh, but price not being the most important factor, it, it still wins in my A-B testing, and we're talking about testing against some of the usual suspects. You had some reservations about USB at first. I had my reservations for sure, but the Orion is just amazing. I don't know how they did it. It just runs. And you're summing into uh, the Shadow Hills, I see, right? Yeah, I recently got the Shadow Hills 2. It seemed like a logical step going with 32 channels, 30 channels, because 1 and 2 is just the door. And that, that's just an amazing, amazing setup. And uh, there's no way I could do that without those two units at that price. Do you have any processing then that comes after that in the analog world? Yeah, like <clears throat> what we do for, for trailers, and, and especially movie trailers actually, the turnaround time is uh, insane. Uh, we're talking about eight hours sometimes from when a request is sent out until they, they need it on their desk. So. I run through uh, a little bit of mastering processing on the two bus. I use the uh, API 2500, the Smart C2 into a Poltec EQ, into the um, Pendulum uh, PL2 uh, limiter. And then you record it back in. And I record that back into the Orion. And uh, how's the A to D section of the Orion? I think? It's amazing. Uh, again, I've AB tested with my previous units. Um, and especially that part, because when you record an instrument, you're like, okay, that's what I recorded, fine. But when you bounce a whole mix that you've been listening to and mixing and mastering, you know 100% how it sounds. What about virtual synths and virtual instruments? Is the, is the latency been any kind of problem at all? No. Again, it's, for me, it's way better. I mean, I haven't had an issue. I can go way... I can go down to uh, 256 or lower in buffer size, and I've tried almost everything. Um, and just the fact of having 
32 channels. If, you're, if you ever want to do any kind of summing and you want to go beyond the, the normal eight, which a lot of companies, you know, you can do eight. But, you know, uh, like Peter Reardon, for example, from Shadow Hill says you, you pretty much has to go above 20 channels summing wise before it really matters. And I feel that that's true. I mean, just the other day I was uh, mixing a, a track for a friend, a few friends of mine, and uh, just a being the two out as opposed to thirty out was just a, an amazing difference. I noticed that, uh, and, our, and I'm sure our viewers are going to notice. I'm going to get a little off topic here, but I noticed that you're of a little bit of an accent. Oh, really? <laughs> Where are you from originally? I'm from uh, Denmark, Copenhagen, Denmark. And you've been in LA for how long? Uh, Thirteen years now. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been in the U.S. for a long time. I studied in Denmark. I, I went to Berkeley in Boston for a while, and then I went here and, and got a student visa and uh, went to MI, Musicians Institute in Hollywood, for a little bit. And then, you know, I've just stuck around. I love it here. You know, music is everywhere, and it's great. So L.A. has been good to you? Oh, for sure. Let plenty of work, keep them busy? Yeah, lately it's it's really picked up, you know, like the trailer world, commercials, production, music in general. It's it's great. We haven't done this in a long time. Your fans never left you. The world hasn't forgotten. Sure, it's impossible, but we've got to try. It's time to play the music. It's time to light the lights. It's time to meet the Muppets. Yes! Come on, guys, let's go! Together. Yeah! Sorry, I was super excited. The Muppets have always been about artistic integrity, not cheap tricks. Check it out! Punches. So how did movie trailers become your forte? How, it, it, and maybe it isn't, but it just seems like those are the ones that you're getting that are that make right. the biggest splash. Exactly. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's my forte, you know, when, you, when you're not 25 anymore and you, you don't want to be on the road all the time. I have a family, you know, this is just fun. You get to create music and uh, make a little bit of money, which works too. Um, so that, that's, that's it and it's really interesting. You get a lot of different requests, you genre-wise, stuff you if you were just doing your own little band, which is fine, you would kind of stay in that niche because that's your band, right? I, I have to go from, from rock to jazz to quirky stuff to hardcore industrial, anything really. So for musicians out there that reach that point where the family starts to happen and they say, oh, I, wanna, I, I need to start getting serious as, as an occupation or I need to do something else, um, is is I guess gleaning from what you were saying a, a good bit of advice to be flexible and broad ranging and cover a lot of genres. Is that really the best approach? Yeah, exactly. If you if you if you take this road and end up here, you you got to be flexible. I think because and fast, I would think, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. The deadlines are uh, a thing of its own, you know. But um, just you know, at some point, if you want to make any money. Um, I'm not saying that's why we do music, but you, you want to make some money. Or you could do, as I did like five years ago, I was a full-time web programmer and web designer. And then I spent the little time I had uh, at the end of the day or when I, when I didn't work uh, on music. And I, I wanted to change that. And I could not do that with just starting a band, uh, there was, there's no way I could do that. I would not make any money. Um, so this is just a good way. I, I get to play music and uh, uh, make some money and, and live and have fun. How much is there when you get footage? Like we talked about the new 300 movie and you were kind of using the old 300 footage because they weren't releasing the new footage yet. Um, so how much how much is there already? Do, are there temp tracks there that you jam with or... Um, to start or is it a blank slate? Does it vary? It varies a lot. I mean, if we're just talking trailers now, 
most of the times you don't get video. Sometimes, like I did, I, uh, you can pull the, uh, if it's a sequel or something similar, you can pull that and just mute the music and, and try to, even if you don't make the song to fit the cuts in that edit, you can still get the vibe from like the 300, like the first one. It's, it's going to be somewhat the same. Right. So you can use that just, just to come up with the track, really. And you do some advertising work too, right? Can you tell us what that's like as opposed to the movie stuff? Yeah, I mean, a trailer is advertising really, but if we're talking advertising for a product, um, we do that too, and that can be really, really specific sometimes. Uh, they can ask for a, a you know, 37 second sequence. Uh, has to be a rock song. Maybe they send a reference, has to sound kind of like that. Not too much, because some, someone will get sued. Something like that, but it needs to include the words California and sunshine, and it needs to have a female vocalist. Bam, that's it, and we need it in 24 hours. So that's, uh, that's a big challenge, and if you don't have something you can pull from in your catalog already, that's close to impossible, but we still try to do it sometimes and, and just wing it, but come up with the best thing we have. You know, write a song, write the lyrics, start producing it, recording it, get a vocalist in, get it down, mix it, comp it, melodyne it if it needs it. Um, mix it, you know, maybe send it to mastering if we feel that the project is so far along and it's good enough to, to do that, and then ship it off to the client and then Maybe it'll fly, maybe it won't, you know, maybe they'll get back to us and say, well, their client, which is actually, you know, whoever, Apple or 7-Eleven, someone, they totally changed direction, so now it needs to be a jazz song and involve some other keywords, so you're like, oh, wow, now I have a rock Boston song. Boston and Rainy. Right, right, exactly, yeah. That, it can change that radical, and then, you know, you, that's, that's just the business, you know, sometimes I spend two, three weeks, you know, 18 hours a day, making three or four uh, uh, options for a certain request. Um, and it, it doesn't end up, you know, taking because they change direction five times in the meantime, you know. But that's just a part of the game. And I'll, I'll keep those tracks and, and use it for a CD release later. Maybe it'll even fit another request, you know, if it's like California Sunshine, that could fit another request, you know. Pretty common. Exactly, yeah. Um, so, uh, video game music, have you delved with that at all? We haven't placed anything, but like I said, a lot of our industrial stuff would definitely fit in video games. And I have talked to a few companies lately and, and uh, shipped some stuff off to them, some industrial, some uh, dance tracks that they wanted for uh, the end of a game trailer. It was still the game trailer, but uh, yeah, it's all the same thing. I mean... It's advertising, right? So trailers, commercials, video games, it's really all the same thing. Yeah, sometimes I'm watching a video game and it feels like I'm watching a movie or at least exactly. the, the vibe of it. Especially, uh, you know, action uh, video games now, they're, they're marketed as a, an action movie and you almost can't tell the difference. Yeah, it does take yeah. a couple seconds on those trailers. Yeah, you know, and all the graphics are so amazing now. It's like, is that real? Or no? I don't know, you know. Do you find in, in Europe that music knowledge, music theory is more widespread than in, in the U.S.? I don't know. I mean, maybe in general, people are more interested in art in general, which includes music. So maybe that aspect of it. And there's also a lot more music in, in the schools, just as a class. So I guess that would account for that. I lived in Europe, in Germany for nine years, and I used to tell people, you know, you'd meet someone on the street and they'd, you know, play, play them a song and they'd say, oh, you know, you should have used a 909 kick instead of an 808 kick. I'm like, what do you, you work at a car factory, what do you know about right. music? It just seems like, especially electronic music in Germany, but I, th I always thought in, in Europe in general that they had a lot more music theory knowledge across right. the board. Well, I think just like programming, and using applications like Cubase Logic was like earlier in Europe. I mean, I used Cubase in like 89 in Europe. 
I think I was 90, 91, right. starting and like, on Atari. Like everyone had Logic or Cubase. That's what they used in Europe. And over here, it's like the last five, ten years, tops that like normal, not musician, have like applications like that on their computer or laptop. In Europe, it was like, you know, 10, 15 years ago that that was more like, even though you weren't a musician by profession, you were, you would, you would still dabble around with music at home. Right. And you, you came over to the States and you went to Berkeley. Correct. Yeah. And how was that experience after studying in, in Denmark? Uh, it was great. There's always like a fascination with the U.S. in general from European, like being born in Denmark. So I, uh, so I was kind of fascinated with, with the U.S. in general. And then there's also, you know, just the, the level of teachers at Berkeley was amazing. Uh, I took a lot of arranging classes that were amazing. Uh, I had already gone to a conservatory music school in Denmark, so you know some of the music theory I, I had already done, um, but it was a, kind of a different approach. I mean, Berkeley has their own approach to music theory. You know, they're kind of different than every other school actually in the in whole world. In what way? In what way do they approach it? That, that That's hard to explain. It's just they don't use the classical way of, of charting stuff. Interesting. Not that they don't also do that, but they also have their own way, more, more jazz oriented. And um, for so, some people think it's easier to, to get, I guess. And how did it prepare you for what you're doing now with, with uh, television and film? Berkeley, it's uh, it's just a really good overall education. I didn't major in a specific, you know, I wasn't like guitar player only. I tried to do a broad range of courses, like I said, arranging, music theory, ear training, you know, all, all stuff like that, that that you can use in anything music related you do. And you played in bands growing up? Oh yeah, I played in a lot of garage bands, rock bands in Denmark and in the U.S. and touring all over the world, touring all over the U.S. in a van for like a month and a half, you know, sleeping in the van, all that, you know. Down by the river. Exactly. <laughs> so that that was its own thing. It was great, you know, but the stuff I'm doing now is... Uh, how much of that edginess from playing in garage bands and bands and uh -huh. touring, how much of that is coming through? Because it... When I listen to your trailer work, it seems like it's it does have a bite and an edge, and there's an energy to it. I guess anything I've ever played comes through somehow. Uh, the stuff we do mostly is uh, like industrial, um, hot call, you know, hot hitting, big sounds, stuff like that. Which that's never I've never played in a band that sounded like that, but I've played in numerous rock bands that that influenced that, I would say. So what's up with this little uh, Casio thing on the floor? Oh, this guy? Yeah, this is kind of <laughs> odd. Uh, it's a Casio, what is it, PT-80? So this is the secret weapon, come on. The, the, yeah, kind of. It's, uh, we, we're working on a quirky CD for like uh, commercials, etc. And uh, we had some good tunes and good melodies and we decided to... So you really are using it. We are really using it. We, <laughs> I bought it off of eBay for um, 15 bucks. <laughs> and, you know, we did three tracks on it. it it's, it's great. It's, um, you know, it's like weird sounding. You know, it doesn't sound good at all. It sounds <laughs> shitty. I tried to find the shittiest one I could and this was it. And, uh, yeah, it works. So Native Instruments or somebody needs to model this and make the quirky well, plug-in. don't give away my secrets here. Quir <laughs> the quirky... No. They should do a model of this. There is a few out there by some other vendors, but this is just uh, really crappy. And it's got so, a little nope. RAM card in there around. What is it's it? got a little RAM well, card here. Yeah. Still works from 1981. Um, yeah, this would fit, you know, these, these tracks could fit in like a quirky indie movie like Napoleon Dynamite type thing or a little funny commercial at least we hope it will but that's the kind of vibe it gets very cool
So Mick, can you give us a little tour of your signal path and the audio? I see that you have uh, some hardware sense that you start off with, and I, I assume then those go right into the recording of the uh, Orion. Uh, where does it go from there, and how do you incorporate like some of the hardware signal processing? Well, the uh, the analog synths. Um, when I run mono, I uh, I go into this uh, A designs ready with the way too bright blue light that you see here. Um, I always go into this guy because it adds some grit to it. I mean, it's already analog, so it, it has the warmth, but this warms it up a little bit more and adds some grit. And then I, I go to, uh, sometimes I hit a compressor. I mean, I don't have to, but if I want to mold the sound that way, I could hit any of the distressors here. And then after that, I, um, I go into the Orion. And I patch it in through this uh, mess of cables right here. And do you ever run any of your internal in-the-box synths out through hardware and come back in? I do the virus, which is, it is a software synth, even though it has a hardware controller. Um, but I will put it through some distressors and then through the patch bay into the Orion again. And then uh, we went over, I know, some of the path that you use after your summing as far as your mastering chain. For monitoring, I see you have a couple sets of speakers. I have some, uh, yeah, f my main ones are the, the ATC 25s, which I, I love to death. They're just amazing, true sounding, nice bottom end, true mids, not too, not too sibilant. Uh, they're, they're amazing. I, I recently got some Quested here just for a second reference uh, hooked up to a SOP which I, I kind of like having the second reference. You don't really need it with the ATCs because they're just amazing, but I still like having it. I also have a little crappy boom box down on the floor for a third reference, you know. It's just hard to get anything done without the crappy boom box. Right? Exactly right, exactly. Well, we really appreciate having you in the Antelope uh, team of artists. Yeah. And, uh, and thanks for taking some time out. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, mate. Thank you.